What is going on, everybody? Welcome to Fight Network's downtown studios. This is Five Rounds. I am John Ramdeen alongside Robin Black. This past weekend, the UFC returned to New York. They were in Brooklyn for UFC 208, the main event, the UFC crowning the inaugural female 145-pound champion. And over the course of 25 minutes, we saw the Dutch fighter Jermaine Durandamy emerge as the new champion. However, uh, clouded in controversy, I felt that Holly Holm, uh, very close fight. Mm -hmm. But if you look objectively, I felt that she won the last three rounds. Other people would throw in the fact that um, th between round two, one and two. After two and after three. After round two and after round three, uh, the bell sounded and Durandamy landed uh, a punch each time, only warned the second time, and to the dismay of Daniel Cormier and Joe Rogan, uh, they were freaking out. They yeah. felt a, a point should be taken. Uh, What's your assessment of what happened over 25 minutes in the main event? Well, when you put those two things together, it becomes stinkier. Yeah. You know, where you you feel a little more uh, it, that it was unreasonable uh, for if you're Holly or if you're a fan. Well, Holly Holmes said that uh, the most significant strikes landed in the fight were those illegal fights, yes. uh, illegal punches. I, and I think they were. There's a lot at play there. Uh, we were talking about it at the desk today. You can. You somebody says your assignment is to fight this person uh, and you're going to have ways strategies that you plan in the long run things are going to change closer and then on the night you're going to have moments that you try to apply a certain attitude or strategy or tactics and uh, one of those can be i'm going to cheat a little bit it is an absolutely valid choice now we'll judge it and know? when you say cheat what does that actually mean because there was no infraction. Yeah. yeah. Nobody was, no, there was no penalty mm -hmm. taken. Mm -hmm. So when you look at these things, the, the groin shots, the mm -hmm. cage grabs, the all the different like, spitting out mouth guards, yep. all these things are in play. But if you do them, how is it cheating? Exactly. Uh, it is cheating because we know we're not supposed to do it, but we get away with it. So we can apply that as a strategy if you choose to. But cheating, if I take steroids and I'm caught, that's cheating, it's a no contest or I lose. Yeah. That's yeah. But, but if I punch you in the face as hard as I can after the bell on purpose, that's look. cheating and I didn't get penalized for it. So that's why it can be applied as a strategy. If we're going to talk about right or wrong or class or sportsmanship or honor or any of those things, we bring those in, we immediately judge that poor. And we're like, I can't believe she fucking. The bell. It's martial arts. It's supposed yeah. to be, there's yeah. supposed to be a level yes. of honor. Yes. That we want that. We want that. But you, we are not the ones in the cage. Yeah. We're not the ones in there. She is. And of the choices that she can make, I'm falling down. Jacare is dragging me to the ground. I'm going <laughs> to grab, grab the fence. I'm grabbing the fence. I'm grabbing the fence. Right? I'm grabbing the fence. So she's whether it was in the moment a choice or a choice not to pull back or it was she's like I'm going to go in there I'm going to be ornery and that could be you can imagine sitting around with coaches and go what do we need to do we need to bully this girl we need to bully her we need to be gritty we need her to know she's in a fight these can be purposeful strategies now uh, we judge it I don't uh, myself as a fan and somebody well I prefer the class of a martial artist but this thing here we have all the options of all of the ways that we want to apply this thing and that, that shows you how to win shows you how to win and that includes she can do that now knowing that your opponent may employ some of these tactics it is now on you to deal to prepare for them and deal with them so after the bell especially that second time uh, protect yourself at all times the the buzzer it signifies the time the clock is stopped but there you are still in battle you are still in this. You are still in conflict. And so it's on you to protect yourself at all times. So it's your failing, too. Mm. Uh, and it's the ref's failing because he's there. But aren't you there to – you're supposed to trust trust the ref. Yeah. Everybody's supposed yeah. to be doing their jobs. Yes. Holly Holm's done her yeah. job. She was yeah. ready for 25 minutes to take a beating, and she did that. Yeah. The referee's job is to make sure he's monitoring time when you – Yeah. 10 yeah. seconds, he's right yeah. – supposed to be right there. So as soon as that goes, he's in there yeah. separating them. So when I'm just looking at it and I'm Holly Holm or I'm her coach or friend, I'm like – this asshole hit me after the bell on purpose, and this asshole didn't protect me. But now, if I'm preparing, I'm like, I need to be prepared for anything. What's anything? Well, maybe that asshole's gonna try to hit you after the bell. Cool, I'll be prepared for that. Uh, well, the ref will stop it. Well, maybe the ref will not be able to stop it. Okay, I'll be prepared for that too. Mm. And so you prepare yourself for that. Um, David Mullins and I were talking about how anything can happen in a fight. Literally, a guy parachuted into a ring. Yeah. Remember? Yeah, that's right. Literally, like when you, it, so you cannot prepare for everything. 
because fan man? listed thousands of things that you could prepare for. No, on that list, there will be no man parachutes into ring on night. So you can't prepare for everything, but you can prepare for certain events. The unknown, though, you're supposed yeah, to be prepared right. for the unknown. That's right. Say, so don't. You're not supposed to be rattled by like. Even though Holly Holm was punched after the after the bell, the reality is. I got punched a whole bunch before yeah, the bell. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm not making excuses yeah. for Jermaine Duran to me. I'm looking at it from the perspective of what can I do to protect myself or to ensure that I win. And among the things we can protect ourselves uh, for is a failure of a ref. The ref might fail me. I got to be ready for that. This person might be dirty. I got to be ready for that. And a guy might parachute into the ring. I mean, I got it. That is, to me, forever the example of anything could happen. Literally anything could happen. Like, what fucking weirder could happen than that? So we could never prepare for that, but we could prepare that something so bizarre could happen, and we have dealt with the reality that when it, when it happens, not if, because weird shit is going Temperature. to Temperature. Look at yep. us in, in, in Ottawa for that show with uh, Rory McDonald and Stephen Thompson. Perfect example. The place was so fucking hot in there. Now, Unreal. again, you're anticipating a certain thing. Now the heat is way yeah. higher than, yeah. than you anticipated. And it's like, oh, God, I, I was managing yeah. for a certain. Now, again, I don't know how the elements guys, affect performances. Yeah. For sure. But they they had can. 40 fights between them, and never had they been in an environment that was even within four or five degrees that much hotter. Yeah. So what do you do? Well, you've prepared for, for variables. Immedi uh, unexpected things will happen. So an unexpected thing is going to happen. And how will I deal with it? Well, I will not be shook by it. I will also understand, hopefully, that, in, say, the temperature or the, the guy parachuting in, it, it, the best case scenario is it affects us both. So I'm going to handle it better. In the case of uh, Holly, it's only affecting me. Mm. And that's why you do it. That's why people... In, choose to implement those aspects of war to something uh, and we can judge it all we like but you, she won I love that you said judge it uh, because we saw um, throughout the night some very bizarre scores I watched the, the Dustin Poirier and Jim Miller fight sensational yeah. awesome battle boys you guys deserve a million bucks a piece just for that type of uh, the damage that you took the, like Jim Miller you're just you we love Dustin Poirier, yes. but Jim Miller just keeps getting better in, in my books. And, and w when you look at 155 pounds, he really is, both these guys, two of the unsung yeah, heroes of 155 sure. and, pounds. And every single man that Jim Miller has ever met in a cage is a better man because they met Jim yeah. Miller. And we're better for seeing him do his thing. And, uh, yeah. But when you look at those scores... 29, 29, 30, 27, 28, 29, 28. It's like they are literally all yeah. over the board. Yeah. So if you're Greg Jackson and you're Mike Winklejohn and you're in the back, are you monitoring what the judges' scores are? So it's like, okay, now we have to change things because yeah. we can't just, uh, you know, execute the same strategy in hopes that these judges are going to see things uh, the way that we see them. Mm -hmm. Now, how can we manipulate things the day of? So you, for sure. And do we take more risk? to be more definitive, and uh, how important is the fight itself? Oh, this one's for a, a title. This is a life-changing fight. But if we take a bigger risk to try to make it a more definitive round and we lose, a risk is a risk because it's a risk. You know what I mean? But she didn't take the yeah. risk. Again, I, no, so she took risk, but she didn't go after it the way, maybe the way she should have. She didn't win the championship. Yeah, exactly. So, but if she had won it, I thought she won three the I last agree. three rounds. If they were right, you would look at it and go, oh, man, it was close. But, you know, I did, like if we took that other risk, she could have got kicked in the head this way. So instead, mm -hmm. we played it close. So unfortunately, the refs got it right. We got it right. I still think it's the right choice, even though the result was not what you wanted. The right choice, if you fought that fight 10 times, is to fight it the right way. Um, rolling dice is not something calculating and intelligent proven winners do uh, over time, which is why a coach becomes a little more conservative. A fighter can say to themselves, you know what, fuck it, we're, we're, we are going for this. I know that, that this choice that I'm going to make runs the risk of spectacular failure, but it gives the possibility of spectacular success. Uh, I might try it. But a coach will have seen that hundreds of times, and they'll have the effects of all 97 of the failures. Right. So they will become a little more high percentage oriented. Um, we were, we'll be talking about uh, TKO probably a lot next week and the week after. Of course. Uh, it's one of the great shows ever. Uh, but a young guy is on it, Michael Imperato, who's a very talented fighter. And I'm really interested to see him fight because he's been working with Claude Patrick. Cool. And Claude Patrick is the best of any coach I've ever worked with. He's the best high percentage choice guy. 
uh, St- yeah, strategy. Yeah, Claude Patrick. Uh, he has a, a gym in Mississauga. It's called Mississauga um, oh God, Elite. God. Elite, 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 one, uh, elite, elite, yeah, elite uh, MMA. Elite MMA. Yeah. Yes, if you're in uh, in Canada and you're ever in the Toronto area, or if go see Claude Patrick because yeah, the high percentage choice, thinking, in the long run wins, it wins, and then and I think that's how they looked at it with the Holly fight. Uh, but I'm telling you, I mean, it, Claude only has you know a couple of fighters. He's got a lot of great students. His white belts. When you see his white belts. Uh, pass guards and stuff like the <laughs> fundamentals, they're, they're so good. But he doesn't have, always focus on fighters, and that's smart. The martial arts isn't, fighters are flaky, they come and yeah. go. But whenever he has one or two fighting, I, we get to call this one. It's a great fight. Um, and Barato yeah. versus Xavier Aloui, yeah. the guy that uh, yeah. lost to Josh Hill. And I wasn't sold. I thought for sure this young kid was going to get crushed yeah. because I think he was, yeah. like you said, 7-0 and yeah. going in against Josh yeah. Hill. But he hadn't really fought yeah. anybody. I'm like, okay, he's going to get dusted. Xavier, you yeah, did a great you job, did, buddy. You did, buddy. We didn't think yeah. that you won, but no. the fact is, yeah. you looked very, very good. Skilled, I'm, I'm talented, very, gutsy, very excited. lots of heart. I'm very excited uh, won p- all kinds of positions yeah. against yeah. Josh yeah. that we'd have never awesome. predicted he could win. Uh, yeah, talented guy. But that is one of a dozen spectacularly matched fights. I know. It's so awesome. Uh, we got to uh, going to continue our discussion about UFC 208, the co-featured bout. We saw the return of uh, middleweight grade Anderson Silva taking on Derek Brunson. I felt that Anderson Silva had won two rounds. It wasn't the most action-packed fight, but when I look at a 41-year-old against a 33-year-old, the 41-year-old hasn't won a fight since... Yeah, 2012. 2012. Yeah. Uh, this is the assignment. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta win. Yeah. You gotta win. And Anderson Silva did what he needed to do to convince yeah. two of those judges that he won two of those rounds. Woo! If you're Anderson Silva, yeah. big yeah. sigh of relief. And, and I was happy for that guy because you can put yourself into that situation. You know, he, he's been the greatest fighter in the world, and 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 we talked about it. We've talked about it a lot in the week leading up and and today. And there's. We understate even as much as you can, how challenging it is and to be that good now. And so he's this brilliant fighter. Now he's 41, et cetera, et cetera. Age, you slow down, so on and so forth. When we're talking about all that, we leave out a massive thing. Dude broke his leg in half, too. Yeah, yeah. Broke his leg in half. Yeah. That's, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I can't actually think of anybody that has come back from uh, from that to this level to circle back years later being uh, able. Uh, what's um, I think Pele, Rash- Pele. Rashad's buddy, uh, the kickboxer from Tyron Spong? Tyron Spong. Yeah. He's back, but now he boxes. I don't yeah, think he yeah. wants to be throwing that yeah. thing. I don't blame yeah. him. Would you? Um, uh, but to to be able to come back in your 40s and get that win and come back from that horrific injury that's pretty spectacular and I thought I did think Brunson won rounds two and three I, uh, Anderson didn't do a great deal but he was able to manipulate Brunson in a way that only a really cagey hmm. special fighter he froze Brunson yeah, he did he, he, really he, hard to do Anderson Silva doing his thing prevented Derek Brunson from even more forward yeah. momentum yeah. and because of that because Brunson wasn't moving yeah. forward the judges yeah. believed Anderson Silva yeah. was in control. I, I think, yes. And he, on some level, he was. he was. But Brunson hit him more than he mm-hmm. hit Brunson in rounds two and three. And he hit him hard. He hit him clean and he hit him hard. And so if I was a judge with as little bias as I could muster and just looked at it, and but that's the thing. That's the beauty of it. Anderson Silva hypnotized Brunson. Mm-hmm. When you can hypnotize the guy you're fighting and the guys watching it, that's spectacular. Yeah. Like, that's some that's some animal kingdom shit. But you know, do you believe that the judges? And again, there's no um, there's no conspiracy here. If you're a, if you're a judge, now, granted it's New York, so they, these guys might be new. Are you are you giving giving everything to Anderson Silva? It's like you throw a you're Derek Brunson. Yeah. You throw a punch, you hit me in the yeah. face. I throw a punch. I hit, Anderson Silva throws a punch and hits Derek Brunson in the face because I'm Anderson Silva. My punch is worth more. Yeah, that's what that's what I mean. Is you try to be unbiased. It's hard. You can have the people that you like and the the ones that you don't. You can have the human element. You've you know, there are, we're human beings. Mm-hmm. Now, this is subjective, but if I were to say that I find Holly Holm more attractive than Jermaine Duran to me, mm-hmm. I would be telling the truth. That's how I feel. And mm-hmm. I look at these mm-hmm. two people. Well, right. I find one more uh, physically attractive to my eye when I look at them. Sure. That's Your part of taste. what it is to be a human yeah. being is to have different personal tastes. Now, I can't let that sway me, 
but I'm also human. So what level of control of my, you know, now you're getting into some deep shit about decision making, but that is all in play. That's their job. That's all in play. And so, you know, uh, a lot of times we get these these cliches and they become the thing. Never leave it to the judges. Never, (laughs) never, never leave it to the judges. Don't, don't, I don't know these people. I don't know what their mm-hmm. human biases are. I, it doesn't make them bad people. Mm-hmm. Everybody has stuff. What What do you like better? Do you like ketchup or mustard? Yeah, I'm a ketchup guy. Ca- see? Yeah, yeah. Depending yeah. on the mustard, Are you a though. bad guy because of that? So now if I ask you to sample all these flavors, you're naturally going to yeah, be more yeah, inclined right. to like ketchup because yeah. you like ketchup. Yeah. And, so, and, and, and t- these guys like boxing yeah, or they exactly. like movement or they like kicks or they have never been kicked in the leg. They haven't been kicked in the leg. Does it hurt to get kicked? <laughs> it hurts. Go and get yourself kicked yeah, in the leg. If it hurts. Never kicked in the but if leg. they don't know that, they don't yeah. know. Uh, and or, or for that matter, when I kick you and you block it, we automatically assume that well, nothing happened. Your arm could be mangled. There's all elbow. these things. So the mo- you need the more you know, uh, the the better job you can do to a degree. Um, and they know what they know. These guys all have other jobs. They have lives. They have families. They, you know, they know what they know. Uh, two of the best performances. Uh, we got to talk about the middleweight division. Anderson Silva getting the job done against Derek Brunson, his teammate uh, Jacare Souza. Um, looking sensational against Tim Boach. And what I saw, and, you know, people will say, well, it was Tim Boach. But what I saw was the best middleweight yeah. in the world yeah. on, on Saturday. I agree. Uh, he just looked so smooth. He looked strong. He looked confident. Uh, it, it felt like if you wanted to knock out Tim Boach, he could knock out mm. Tim Boach. But it's like, why mess around? I know I'm better here. Let's just get this out of the way as fast as humanly possible. We'll try it. I'm ready to go 25 minutes, 15 minutes, but I'm ready to yeah. go 25 minutes. Well, let's see if we can get him out of yeah. here fast because of your certain skill set. And he proved that that's, yeah. he does have that. You're watching one of the greatest fighters in the world. There's no doubt about that. And what, are we, what do we celebrate? We celebrate greatness, you know? Um, I want to see that guy fight all these guys. I know that you go back to the Luke Rockhold fight from, what is that now, six years ago? Oh man, Luke Rockhold yeah. fought. Luke Rockhold yeah. for the UFC Championship. Uh, Strikeforce. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> Strikeforce Championship, September 2011. Yeah, uh, almost six years ago. After he That's sat, magic. Yeah, after he yeah. Uh, he tapped, listen to this. So he got not, KO'd by Gegard Mousasi with that up kick. Yeah. And then there was he a, was doing great yeah, up until great, that moment. Doing great. Uh, after that, there was a no contest uh, against Mayhem. Uh, then he choked out uh, Matt Lindlin, former UFC middleweight title challenger. And then he uh, beat Joey Villasenor, beat Tim Kennedy, choked out former UFC welterweight champion Robbie Lawler, lost his uh, lost to to Luke Rockhold for, in a great fight. In, in a great fight. And then again went on a run. Um, not Has he game. lost since that? That Luke Once. Rockhold? Yeah, rolled Jim Romero, Romero. Which he was robbed. He didn't, he didn't lose that he didn't fight. Lose that. Uh, but uh, knocked out Derek Brunson, uh, submitted Ed Herman, Kamozi, Yushin Okami, uh, Gegar Musasi again. This guy's yeah. on fire. You're looking at one of the great fighters on, on the planet. Yeah. You really are. And it, when you get to see him fight, it is spectacular. I don't care about the belt or the number one thing or who's I it's not interesting to me uh, I know it, it is to a lot of people so I, I'm not the reason I am is because it gives them more money I was gonna say that so, but I, I know it's important to him yeah and as a fan of this great artist I want to see him get what he mm-hmm. wants but what I want selfishly I just want to see him fight Chris Weidman yeah you know what I mean yes. I just want to see him fight all these yeah. guys now if he got paid a ridiculous amount of money for those yeah he would agree I think ah, ah, some stupid yeah. metal you can keep thing. the belt you can keep I, the yeah belt. I'll just beat yeah, all, all of the great guys. fighters yeah in the world and uh, but I, yeah for that artist for that genius it would be nice to see him get the thing that he wants which is a belt and, a, and the money he deserves and the acclaim the rec- and appreciation yeah. for me I just think we should appreciate this level of talent way more we should talk about it more we should show the highlights we should show what he can do when you when we were talking about him on our previous show and I think that's online uh, I'm pretty sure you can see it on our YouTube channel. It was uh, Jacques Ray. I don't know what you would Google, but but it's there within the last week on the Fight Network YouTube ch- uh, channel. You just look at the highlight reels that the boys put together of Jacques Ray. He's you, good uh, everywhere. Yeah. Uh, oh, and my keys to victory. Paul Shaughnessy put one together. And uh, you look at what this guy does. And these are the best fighters in the world he's doing it to. you would be like, oh, it's Chris Camozzi. Chris Camozzi is one of the 30 best fighters exactly. in the world yeah. of his yeah. weight. 
in the world. Out of hundreds of millions people of people that, of that no. size, this is like one of the 20 or 30 best. And then you see what he can do to them. It's a level of skill and expertise that is so rare. It's rare. So, uh, and I, if you... Tr Trans, um, move it over to some other sport. When you see the b the very best basketball player get dunked over, yeah, you know, yeah. or just stripped out of his shorts as somebody beats him, you're just like, how is that possible? These are the best guys. I mean, if a guy does that to me or you, yeah, it's like, expected. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> look, look at the neat shit he can do. Yeah. But when they do it to the best, it's mind blowing. And that's what this guy does every single time. And how important, uh, if you're Jacques Ray, that your mysterious because mm -hmm. when we think of Jacques Ray, I think most people think well he's a submission expert who's big and strong and durable and has punching power but he's more than that wow. though he's, he's he's crafty and he's fluid and he's he's unhinged and he has a it feels like every time he's in in competition he's looking for the finish non stop yeah. what what do you believe separate Jacques Ray from the rest of the division. That's, that's a really interesting uh, thing. And the first thing that comes to mind is uh, uh, my friend Angelo is uh, uh, coach Angelo Reyes. So when I'm in Vegas, sometimes I will train with him. And sometimes we'll just hang out and eat seafood and chat. And uh, we we're talking about Frank Mir. And Frank Mir, of course, we know how brilliant he's at jiu-jitsu. But w the guys, the jiu-jitsu guys, who their method, their, their method of improvement and development is a, based around, like, improving these subtleties. You, why can his Kimura just details, about... Yeah. yeah, details, 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 more details, more specific. They, they, they narrow everything down. And when some of those guys start to apply that type of learning to striking, it's shocking what they can do. The, a lot of jiu-jitsu guys do not develop into great strikers, but the ones that do do it because they're detail-oriented. And they don't think a, a punch is just a punch, but then it becomes something different. Until later, it becomes just a punch again. In that different, it was Bruce Lee who said that. And at first, a punch was just a punch, and a kick was just a kick. And then a punch was more than a punch, and a kick was more than a kick. Until you fully master it, and then it's just a punch and a kick again. In that period, in the middle of development, they their, their details are so good that in the end, the chaos of when you first fight jiu-jitsu, when you're a white belt, or you're up against a white belt, the craziest, <laughs> all this, it's all chaos. And they make sense of the chaos. And then striking becomes like that to them. They see it all coming. They see it all mm -hmm. coming. And uh, there, there's something of that style of study that makes you a different kind of striker. You're able to do it with calmness and, and execute and express it rather than throw punches. You just express punches. Yeah. So, and, I mean, that's what we're seeing from Jacques Ray. It's just he's, his level of comfort, comfort inside of the cage is, is quite astounding. And... He understands. It's like if the UFC is not going to give me my title shot, I'm just going to keep doing this. I'm going to yeah. beat Vitor. I'm going to beat Tim Boach. I'm going to smoke these guys. Mm -hmm. And whoever's next, it doesn't matter who's next. Put them up against me. I'll beat Gegard. I'll beat Chris Weidman. Yeah. I'll beat the former champion Luke yeah, Rockwell. Give me that I'll, I'll, Romero I'll beat again. all these guys again. Yeah. And eventually you'll have no yeah. choice but to yeah. give me my title And shot. in the meantime, you will keep getting better as a martial artist, which he's still not maxed out. And you're going to make your money. And if your goal is, you have a, a goal. And it, we're seeing the exact same thing with Damian Maya, who is just as brilliant. And it's also, it's, it is really interesting to me, jiu-jitsu became the least important thing a few years ago. You just have to be able to not get submitted mm -hmm. and get back to your feet and shut it down. A lot of guys didn't even learn jujitsu. Mm -hmm. They learned the application of not being Hacks. submitted. Yeah, these, you know, primary choices. If I do this, if I win this battle, all other battles become irrelevant. Uh, and, uh, but then these guys, as soon as that happens, so guys like this are, oh, good, because I'm still getting better. They think they have the answers. Now, give me a year. Never mind if it becomes three like Maya, and we're going to have the answers to all these answers because you have answers to shit we did four years ago, and you're all training it as if you think that's good enough. Oh, we're going to murder you, and that's now we're seeing the guys with a heavy focus on the beautiful art of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, the true game of it. They they supersede these answers, and then it's inevitable. And then the guys will find new answers, and they'll be like, oh yeah, see, jiu-jitsu is not important again. And then guys like that'll be like, oh, come you come back again, you dummies. Do you do you yeah. feel though the only guys because you, you mentioned Damian Maya and you mentioned Jacare, these guys are at the top mm -hmm. of the food chain. And again, you you're saying some of these. Uh, um, Jiu-Jitsu guys that turn that blossom into outstanding strikers. I have to uh, look at the former heavyweight champion Fabrizio Verdum as well. Mm -hmm. When you look at these guys, 
they're all world jiu-jitsu champions. Mm-hmm. They're all at the highest level. Uh, I don't think Damian Maia is world jiu-jitsu he was, champion. But, but we, we know we, what Damian we know, Maia, we know. Yeah. But yeah. when you look at these guys, they are at the top yeah. of the food chain when it comes to that. So they're already thinking differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, are those the, the only guys that can achieve that? If you're you know, a high-level purple belt where you're tearing it up in competition, can those guys achieve that success? Some will, for sure. It's, it is interesting. There's no question that the... The path of, be- of mastering something, I'm reading this amazing book, and uh, I actually am listening to it. It's called The Art of Learning cool. uh, by Josh Watkins. And I talked about it on Ask Robin Black the other day, and uh, it's incredible. This guy was a chess world champion. Oh, you're telling me about this. Yeah, and then later he became a type of kung fu push hands world champion and so forth because the the act of mastery. I actually have that book. Yeah, read it. It's fantastic. I I started reading it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, he started as a chess guy and then turned into that. Right, he was younger as as a chess guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, The act of ma the. Another book I I read. It's um. It's just called Mastery. Unfortunately, I forget the author's name briefly, but mastering something there is an art to mastering something how you study it what what the study and the knowledge that you've gained opens up for further study to make something deeper and that is a path that these guys have all already walked they've already mastered mm-hmm. something so mastering so they understand thing, that they understand, they understand the, the, process. Amount of the time yeah. the energy w- mm-hmm. what your focus needs to be what some of the roadblocks become mm-hmm. and they have the experience to some of us get to a roadblock or a plateau and we go well we're maxed Hands out up. Other people get to one and they realize, okay, this is where the difference is made between uh, Jacques Array and Tim Boach. Not picking on Tim Boach. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. We've, they're the yeah, simple yeah, comparison because yeah, yeah. they just fought. Uh, the difference is that some people f- find their plateaus and stay there, and other ones now know the real hard work. The difference will come from you learning and sometimes working harder and sometimes working gentler to get past your plateau and go further. And every single world champion in bla- uh, jiu-jitsu that you just named have done that many times in their life. So... Um, Whose uh, seminar are we going to? Bruce Lee's guy. We're going Dan to Dan Santo. Yeah. They say that uh, that the greatest John Jacques Machado said the best student he ever, had, ever had in his life was, was Dan Santo. Yeah. He, he said he under- never missed a class. Yeah. I think he was sixty years <laughs> yeah. old, yeah. and it's like yeah. every single yeah. day the idea is to learn yeah. this art. Yeah. And you know, imagine being twenty-five and having that mind. Wow. And that's what Max Holloway has. Max Holloway right. has the understanding that we don't just show up to the gym. We have, we, we're improving our ability to throw this kick. We're improving our ability to learn. We're improving our ability to focus so that a focused Max Holloway at, at whatever he is now, 26? How old is Max Holloway? He's a young man. Uh, it has more focus. Yeah, 25, 26. More focus than the 22-year-old Max Holloway had. So he is not just learning this kick, but he's able to absorb it and implement the learning at a higher level than he could before. So that's how this exponential growth happens. Not just like, well, if I can get... 10% better at throwing kicks in a year, that means next year I could get 10% better. But if you got 10, 10% better at throwing kicks this year and 10% better at learning and 10% better at recovery, next year you can improve your kick 14%. He just turned 25, turned 25 yeah. in December. Yeah. You know what I mean? So think about with this guy, what Dan Inosanto took a lifetime to understand and apply to his learning, this guy has that ish or he's mastering that at 25. Simply you imagine yeah. what kind of level of athletes and performers and everything the future, we're going to see the in the next decade. The future is just, yeah. whoa, just mind-blowing. How can, how, can you, how can you be that good yeah. at 25? Not just that skilled, but that good at being becoming better. That's terrifying. It's <laughs> amazing. You, know, you have to watch Max Holloway. We have to watch him yeah. for the rest of our lives. But then the next generation will be even more frightening. Uh, well, one of the fights that uh, we have to talk about before we wrap things up here is Dustin Poirier, Jim Miller, these guys giving the uh, fans in Brooklyn, New York, uh, a sight to see. Uh, you, you saw creativity and you saw toughness and you saw desire and you saw damage mm-hmm. and you saw uh, t- beautiful skill over the 15 minutes. Uh, the judges didn't even know what the fuck they no. were seeing. Uh, one, one was 20, 29, 29, yeah. 30, yeah. 27, yeah. 29, 28. Yeah. Uh, And it ended up being uh, Dustin Poirier emerging with the majority decision victory after getting the fucking shit kicked out of his legs in round three. And again, if you've never experienced leg kicks, 
Again, just get a friend to kick you in the leg. Yeah. And that, again, that, that, that <laughs> you, you, you still can't even comprehend what, the, what it would be like to have Jim Miller in full attack mode landing on you. So everything Jim Miller has done for the last 15 years has been about being able to hit people harder. Do you know what I mean? Everything. Everything he does has been for that purpose. And now he kicks you there, and then now you can survive. And moments later, you and people talked about it after. They're like, well, you know, the adrenaline wears off. Yes, but it's also he's just overriding pain. It's not just that, well, we have adrenaline, therefore I'm not feeling anything. He's just overriding it. He's making the, the strength of his will is making his, the reality of the fact that he can't walk not a reality for now. That's incredible. Uh, that, so Evan Boris, uh, my friend and, and coach, uh, good friend, he um, texted me the next morning. He's like, did you rewatch that fight? I said, not yet. I'm just leaving, doing the pod, Sunday morning podcast. And he said, I said, why, what did you see? Uh, normally, I wouldn't ask because I want to see my own yourself, things, but yeah. it was interesting because he just said, he said, it's just a, a spectacular fight, but he, he said, just so many adjustments made. Mm -hmm. And so you go in, and oh, cool, which I may have noticed. I, I notice things like that fairly often, but it gave me a, someone else's perspective to watch, and you saw things happened in that fight that each guy both had guys. to, yeah, to both guys. Jim Miller was, didn't have the answer in round one, and he figured, and he yeah. found the That's answer. That's what I loved. That, that adjustment that Jim Miller made in the timing and the commitment and had to turn it up a little bit, but in just the right way, and the, and the angle in, and understanding what was coming at him, that adjustment that he made was pretty spectacular. And then Dustin then makes those adjustments while dealing <laughs> yeah. With an imperfect, with a damaged weapon and standing, you know, platform uh, and moving uh, device. And uh, all of that is happening, all of it in front of you while they both show unparalleled will. That's why we watch it. That's the, it, that one everybody understands. We don't have to explain anything. It's cool if you look and you go, wow, oh, how did he adjust that? He did that in the fight with this. Oh, man, and all of those things are interesting, but even without them, you just play that fight for someone and people are, oh, I get this. But again, it's the details, and that's why I love, I, I knew this would be one of those fights. I had a feeling, we, we both yeah. felt it was going to be yeah. fight of the night mm -hmm. because of that, but it was the details mm -hmm. in there that I thought was so spectacular. I think Jim Miller threw a, a right body kick. It was caught by uh, yeah. Poirier. Poirier put yeah. him to the ground. Jim Miller immediately yeah. picked his leg and yes. took this guy yeah. down from yeah. his back. Yeah. It's like yeah, just amazing. stuff like that. It's like amazing. just the, the, the level. Yeah, and that moment is a choice and it's trained. It's when in this situation, I'm good. Uh, one of my choices is to do something like this, and and that's also brilliant study. Uh, I find in these moments, this opportunity is there. Nobody, most guys aren't doing it, so it's unexpected. I'm, yeah, I'm going to take gonna it next it. time I'm there. So it's just stuff like that that you saw throughout the the fight, as you pointed out. Each guy, it's like, okay, I'm not doing, I'm not getting the better of these exchanges. I got to make adjustments. Yeah. Okay, I make adjustments. This, the other yeah. guy's like, holy shit, this yeah, guy exactly. made an adjustments. Yeah. I've got to do yeah. some things. There so. were four or five of those happened uh, back and forth each way, uh, and all of the things that you saw of heart and guts and toughness and ah, uh, that's. You don't have to, you can play that fight. When people don't, und and some people may not like the pain or they may not like damage, it, it does make some people uncomfortable. So this won't help those people. <laughs> you won't be able to convince those people with this. But people who just, they like sports, but they don't really like this, um, they show them that fight, they'll get it. They'll, yeah. they'll know, they, they know what it is. I thought UFC uh, 208 was a success. I've heard people complaining, but uh, you know, you had some storylines. We were talking about what's mm -hmm. going to happen after the main event. Uh, somebody's going to win a title, but who are the challengers? Well, I think automatically yep. you have a rematch. You have a story. You go with the rematch unless you're going to use Cyborg. So you have a couple of interesting stories. Uh, Durand, I think, uh, taking some time off. Did say yeah, injury. Some injury or something, something like yeah. that. Yeah. So right now the division can kind of sort itself out. I mean, a number one contender match between yep. Holly Holm and, and Cyborg. With the winner to face yep. off with the the new champion, I think that would make sense for a lot of people. Yep. But some some great stories coming out of UFC 208. Uh, of course, we got to look ahead. UFC um, Fight Night going down uh, this Sunday from the Scotia Bank Center, Halifax, Nova Scotia. The heavyweights will collide. Travis Brown taking on Derek Lewis. Uh, 185 pound matchup for the former welterweight champion Johnny Hendricks.
taking on former Bellator middleweight champion Hector Lombard. Our boy Elias Theodoro taking on Cesar Ferreira. Tiago Santos, uh, who beat Elias Theodoro, taking on Jack Marshman. Our boy Nordine in a great fight against uh, Santiago Ponzinibbio. Oh, yeah, that's uh, good. Our man uh, Nordine <clears throat> spent a lot of time for this training camp in, in uh, Thailand in preparation. Eamon Zahabi taking on Vieira, Randa Marcos, Carla Sparza, Sam Cecilia, and good, Gavin yeah, Tucker, who's good, making yeah, his cool. UFC debut. And I don't, know if, I, I don't know if they're going to kick off the card with this, but Alex Ricci, our buddy, taking on the hard-hitting Paul Felder. And uh, you, you managed Ricci before. I did. You said they were, you, the, uh, the fight with Felder was supposed to happen yep. outside of the UFC. Yep. We had that booked uh, outside of the UFC. I think it was Felder's last fight before the UFC, and it was going to be Ricci at one point, and something changed. So that, they, he understands They know that. each other. Ricci has fought the toughest kickboxers in the world. Uh, I mentioned Angela Reyes. Ricci's working with him down in Vegas, and uh, they have a different, they've given Ricci a different playbook to work with. And uh, he has different choices and different options. So if you studied Ricci before, I'm not sure that Felder has, but he may have even back for that. This is not going to be the same Alex Ricci. He's Alex Ricci with a different approach and a different, things flow into, into things differently under the system that they've built him. So it's very, I'm very interested to see it. Um, uh, Ricci's a very, very talented guy. He's been kickboxing for so many years over in the biggest yeah, stadiums yeah. in Thailand. So uh, this is the kind of fight that makes sense. The, the one thing about Alex Ricci, I love Alex Ricci. He's just the nicest guy. cat. If you spend any yeah. time with him, it's like yeah. he, you want to be around yeah. Alex Ricci. Uh, but what I've noticed is that he, if he feels, it seems that he second guesses himself, that he, he isn't, you pointed it out before when you were saying, who was it that you were referring to? Oh, um, Uriah Hall. Yeah. But he gets in his own yeah. way. Right. And that's right. kind of the what, what I've seen from Alex. Yep. You know that yep. he's capable of doing yep. other things. But what is it about crossing that line mm -hmm. that we never see from him? Well, we have seen. We have seen, and, yeah. uh And he has to understand that. And you have to just admit that, that there are times where I am not free to perform. And uh, we've seen that from lots of different guys. And yes, Alex has had, they, we've seen that before, but in fights that he's won as well. In this one, he needs to go in there and be free, trust the plan, trust the, the skills, trust himself, and go in there and fight this guy. And uh, I think that's what we're gonna see. Uh, I know Evan Boris, who I spoke about earlier, is a very close friend with Alex, and I believe he's going out there to be, you know, uh, uh, Angelo will be the corner man and the coach, but sometimes you got to have somebody really close to you, somebody who can emulate your opponent just a little bit in the week and be a good friend. And so Evan, it's a cool team that they've got, people that we're really close to, so we should get a lot of interesting insight from Halifax. From we're going to wrap things up here on five rounds. Later in the week, we'll take a closer look of all the action going down in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, and then we're going to be talking about TKO, and then our trip to Vegas. Sin City, Las Vegas, as UFC 209 goes down on March 4th. He's Robin Black. I'm John Ramdean. Gotta thank Chase and Jeff for running the board and you guys, more importantly, for tuning in. We'll see you later in the week.